Thank you, Marla. And now we have, do have time for a few more comments or thoughts. Afaf, I see you're getting, I see several people. Okay. Um, good morning, or good afternoon now. My name is Claudia Booker. I am a certified professional midwife. I practice in this region. I do mostly home birth. I also work in an out-of-hospital birth setting sometimes. And I am very much want to encourage you all and to give you marching orders, really, to when we're looking around at solutions that hopefully will work very well overseas, that we look at some of the dynamics that are happening here in the world of midwifery um, and how we can impact our marginalized communities better than we are doing currently. Uh, currently in the United States, the face of birth is changing. Uh, soon, the women of childbearing age will be made up almost the majority of women of colors. And that will have a dynamic change on how the services that we're looking to provide our clients will change. Um, we have roughly 42 million Spanish-speaking people in our country now. Um, and a limited number of Spanish-speaking carriers, um, health workers for those. We have a large number of women of color who would love to become midwives and community health workers, but um, the world of midwifery in America is still made of majority of midwives who happen to be white and who happen also to be either married or in a financial relationship that allows them to um, be able to live off of the income that they produce that. That way, 47% of African-American women over the age of 27 are single parents without a strong financial base to be able to pursue midwifery in the traditional ways that mid people have become midwives over the years. We need to look at the same way we're looking at a system that does not work elsewhere. This system of midwifery may not work for the women who want to become midwives who are women of color and to serve women who look like them. We have to always remember that in America, too, we have to have programs that are culturally, religiously congruent to the people that we serve. And we need a great deal of, of help on how to develop replicable, sustainable models of midwifery on a community basis uh, for those who are single and small-term practitioners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said. I'm Kathy Blakesley. I um, have... Uh spent most of my career at USAID, and my last position was as director of the Office of Women in Development. The last three years I've been lucky enough to spend with the IOM. And I just wanted to, to reiterate something that did come up um, earlier, and that is the socio-cultural context in other countries and the fact that there is discrimination against women and all levels. And we funded from my office a business, um, women's business entrepreneurship project and went to look at it afterward. And all of the successful women had backing from their husbands or their fathers, or they were, um, they were widowed. They didn't have a choice. They had to go and make it. So how do we provide what was provided by their husbands and fathers, which wasn't necessarily money, in some cases it might have been, but not necessarily. How do we provide that kind of support if it's not there in their families? Because that, that seemed to be an important element in, in the successful um, places. And it's something that if it's not there, it can really, um, really jeopardize the woman's chances of being a success. I think part of that also is are women brought up to think that they can run um, a business like that. The women entrepreneurs that were financed with micro um, loans tended to repeat what they did. If they set up a small shop and it was successful, they might set up another small shop down the road. They didn't grow it bigger. Like men tend to grow things vertically. The women tend to just repeat what they had done once at the same level. How do we? Um, change that kind of mindset? Yeah. I, I think that's a very important question for all of us to keep in mind. And I think you heard examples this morning, particularly of some of these projects where there is a lot of work going on to empower women. Um, 
in my experience, when, when you fund women, for example, you are empowering them. When you develop programs for education and training and for being able to move up in your levels of care, uh, you are empowering them. The other piece, um, two other pieces actually, one is that women often are tremendously powerful but don't let the men know it, okay? <laughs> And I've, I've actually published on this, um, both when it comes to women's reproductive health, but we've seen it very much in, say, market women, for example, and the, the women entrepreneurs in Kenya. So that um, women have this sub rosa culture uh, that they do learn, and they learn from other women. And what that means is then the second piece, and that is that women can support each other and women can help each other. And there's, there's a wonderful story a while ago from in family planning of the Korean mothers clubs um, that were essentially started for women to be able to talk about child health, but they discovered that the men were gambling away their money at the local brothel, and they weren't getting the money for the families, but in Korea, um, women control the paycheck. So basically, what the women did with their gambling money is they bought, the, uh, with not their gambling, their mahjong money, sort of their, their money, was to buy the brothel and turn it into a store. Um, so this little group that was formed, I think, by USA idea of women to talk about health, solved their, problem, their health problem by eliminating the place where men would go spend income that they needed for their families. And I just think the, the world is full of examples like this. We need to bring them out. We need to encourage them. We need to support them. Um, but women are pretty amazing and resourceful, and we also need to acknowledge that. Speaking of amazing and resourceful, Afaf. Af. I almost don't want to say anything after this. This is a wonderful <laughs> ending for a great day. I'm just absolutely thrilled that we finally are putting together empowerment of women and empowerment of nurses at the same breath and talking about how they are very much related. For a long time, the women's movement divorced itself from the nursing movement, and the nursing movement divorced itself from a feminist movement. And I think we are coming back to see that it's, if we do one, we need to do the other because it really does help the community. I, uh, I also want to say to my colleague here that discrimination is not in other countries. It is right here, very alive in this country. And let's not forget that. Um, and I think what's, what other places are suffering from, we are suffering from. Three things I would like to, to say. One is that um, I'm absolutely thrilled about the private investment for in nurses and midwives, but I'm hearing more investment at in terms of practice and entrepreneurship. And I'd like to hear more about investment in education of nurses. We're not going to be able to get to where we want to be without educating nurses and not, not believing that we just, it's a, a sharing of, uh, what is it? <laughs> it's not, it's uh, practice sharing, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not shifting, it's sharing. So it's not by just giving them funds to open clinics, it's really by educating them. This is how they can have a voice and they can feel secure to speak up. Number two, it's not only educating nurses, but I think we need to go back to the Lancet report where we are talking about all the education of professions is outmoded and we've got to do interprofessional education. So I think these are the two things that we need to be investing in a lot more than some of the investments that are going on because it's voice, self-esteem, and ability to speak up on behalf of the people. The last thing I want to say is that I have very mixed views about uh, community workers because I feel that community workers is cheap labor for women, by women, and that we don't really move them up the ladder, and it's sort of like cheap labor for nurses and midwives in other countries, and I'm product of one of those other countries where it has improved through education. So I can't emphasize more the importance of education for girls and for women. And thank you, everybody, for a fantastic day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just wanted to follow up on thinking about education differently. Um, in Thailand, for example, when they were trying to move to the nurse practitioners, they thought they had to have master's degree because they didn't know our history. They didn't know that we started the nurse practitioner movement with nurses at the associate degree level being able 
to move to that and that we had started there. And so I think we just have to revisit a little bit in, in Hong Kong, when people graduate with a BSN, they are also a midwife or, or a public health nurse. And so I think we just need to revisit what we're doing. And then the other part of that, which I thought was interesting is, uh, I come from a rural background, so I was very interested in your midwife story. But we really do have to tackle the, third, the issues around restriction of, of practice because I have assisted a number of people finding a midwife in another state because they can't get a midwife where they are. And I think that's true also with nurse practitioner care. And the last thing, if Ruth were here, I think she had to leave, right? If Ruth were here, one of the things that she would say is that she's already doing family care and the models that you talked about were family care so they didn't end up with the infant and so i think we do have models where we can look at the com coming together of some of the nurse family nurse practitioner and some of the midwife role we've been so segmented in this country that we've really not been helping ourselves so i would just like for us to revisit some of this in the in the larger educational context yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I had a note to mention that and, and didn't, so I appreciate it, that um, bringing the midwifery and the baby and child and family care together, I think is gonna be important. Everything you've said about the health professions education, absolutely critical. And we are starting to have these conversations, but I hope that the conversation we've had today is gonna help us move those conversations along more quickly. Um, so I, I wanna thank everyone who has worked so hard to make today a success and to produce this amazing report. And also remind you that the um, uh, IOM Forum for Health Professions Education uh, sponsored this. I think I want to thank you, Patrick, because the forum wouldn't even exist without Patrick Kelly's supporting AFAF's uh, energetic push on that. Um, and I, I think that what we've heard today, Patrick, is one of the big additions to the work of the forum is this concept of empowerment, of the, the fact that you can do both things at once, that you can move forward, particularly women's empowerment, but um, in general empowerment and marry that to healthcare and health professions education. And so that's something we will take back um, to the forum members. And then um, finally, the, the forum is supported by Patricia Cuff, uh, who is the staff person who runs everything to do with it. And again, we wouldn't be here today without your efforts, Patricia. I wanna thank you. And I also uh, want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about logistics, uh, sort of how and where we get lunch, and what next. So thank you all very, very much. And, and thank you, Susan, for chairing this uh, session today. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, also, a call out to Marla. This wouldn't have happened if she hadn't brought the idea to our forum. Uh, AFAF, I can't thank you enough for just getting the ball rolling with the whole forum. And I need to also call out some of the staff. Rachel Taylor is with us. We partnered on this program with the Public-Private Partnership Forum, and she's here representing that forum. And also the person who sort of had a baptism by fire. If you could get a round of applause for Bridget Callahan. She's been with us. She's been with us for less than a month, and she has pulled off this meeting seamlessly, mostly, except for the phone call in the middle. But, but no, it, it's, it did an amazing job. Um, as far as logistics go, we'd like you all to join us for lunch. I know a lot of you have a lot of thoughts, and I believe that our speakers are going to be joining us for lunch, and that's going to be in the room just around the corner. You can't miss it. You have to pass by it on your way out. It's called the, the, the West, West Room, I think. But there's some tables set out there. There's a lunch. Please join us. Please chat with the speakers. Enjoy yourself. Those of you who want to come back into this room and talk about how the Global Forum can take this idea forward through an innovation collaborative that we're putting together. It's going to be chaired by Bjorg Pals de Terre, and it's called the Innovation Collaborative on Learning Through Community Engagement. We're going to be talking about that in this room. We ask all of you who want to come back just to grab your lunch and come back in for a casual conversation about that innovation collaborative. Thanks all for joining us. Bye now.